Tonight, continuing clashes. Protesters and supporters of former Prime Minister Hasina go head to head. Demonstrations continue to turn violent with targeted attacks on religious minorities. New reigns. Youngblood takes over the Prime Ministerial seat in Thailand's parliament as former leader Thaksin Sinatra, daughter, sits in the helm. Mpox in Pakistan. The contagious diseases first detected in Africa now makes its way to the Asian continent as the first ever detection caused immediate safety measures to be activated. Activated. Flower Power Brussels rolls out a massive flower carpet comprised of millions of blooms in the middle of historic square. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Aquil Qureshi. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News for the final bulletin. I'm Akul Qureshi for this week as we wrap up with some key stories to report to you from all across the globe. Starting off in our region with Bangladesh. Dozens of protesters who were part of the student-led movement that ousted Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina gathered on the streets of Dhaka to deter any rally by her supporters on the country's former public holiday named National Morning Day. The day was designated to mark the anniversary of the assassination of Hasina's father and president, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, in 1975 under Hasina's regime. The protesters, many of them students, wielded sticks and flags while crowding around and shouting at individuals wearing black, whom they believed to be Hasina supporters. Simultaneously, dozens of relatives of the victims of enforced disappearance victims gathered in front of the office of the new Bangladeshi chief advisor seeking justice. Around 300 people died in student-led demonstrations that began as protests against employment quarters but later spiralled into a movement seeking Hasina's overthrowing. Meanwhile, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi said he hoped for a restoration of peace, stability and the safety of minorities, especially Hindus, in Bangladesh. Emotions run high as protesters, doctors across India marched on streets with protesters chanting slogans and calling for justice for the victim of a brutal rape and murder at the hospital in the eastern city of Kolkata. Here in Kolkata, women are marching for what they say is to reclaim the night. Clutching candles and chanting slogans, they're demanding justice for a young female doctor brutally raped and murdered in one of the city's government hospitals last week. The tragedy took place on the night shift whilst the 31-year-old victim worked, after she'd taken a break from her 36-hour shift to sleep on a carpet in a seminar room, where her body was found bearing multiple injuries. Many government hospitals have suspended services nationwide in protest, and demonstrations have erupted across the country. Here in the capital, women are frustrated about the lack of measures keeping them safe. The victim's family deserves justice as soon as possible and the most severe punishment awarded. There should be a federal probe because it's important rapists are scared to do this. That hospital claims to be one of Asia's biggest private hospitals. If security can be breached there, then that's not good enough. The event has drawn parallels with the 2012 New Delhi Nirbhaya case that triggered sweeping changes in laws protecting women after a 23-year-old was gang-raped and murdered on a moving bus. The case has been transferred to the country's Central Bureau of Investigation. Thailand's parliament elected political Nirtan Piyatangran Shinatra as its youngest prime minister only a day after she was thrust into the spotlight amid an unrentling power struggle between the country's varying elites. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent. This is Nevanmeer Pranasingha from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Yes, Akhil. Pei Tong Tan won with 319 votes or nearly two thirds of the house. She was not present in parliament and watched the vote from Phil Thai's headquarters. The 37 year old, daughter of divisive political heavyweight Takshin Sinawatra, sailed through a house vote and now faces a baptism of fire. Just two days after Ali Shweta Thavisin was dismissed as Premier by Judiciary Central to Thailand's two decades of intermittent turmoil. 
at stake for Petong Tan could be the legacy and political future of the billionaire Srinivatra family whose once unstoppable populist juggernaut suffered its first election defeat over two decades last year and had to deal with its bitter enemies in the military to form a government. Over to you. Thank you for that. That was other than a world news special correspondent Nivenmi promising her from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Pakistan's health minister has confirmed at least one case of monkeypox virus in a patient who had returned from a Gulf country. As provincial health authorities reported, they had detected three cases. A Pakistani health official said authorities would be taking all necessary measures, though they did not yet know the strain of the virus. Dr. Irshad Ali Rogani, the Director of Public Health at Directorate General Services of Khyber Park Tuntua, said the sequencing of the confirmed case was underway and that it would not be clear which variant of MPOX the patient had until the process was complete. Global health officials confirmed an infection with a new strain of the Mpox virus in Sweden and linked it to a growing outbreak in Africa, the first sign of its spread outside the continent. The disease caused by the monkeypox virus leads to flu-like symptoms and pus-filled lesions. It is usually mild but can kill, with children, pregnant women and people with weakened immune systems, such as those with HIV, all at higher risk of complications. When Prime Minister Fumio Kishada announced he would not run in the Liberal Democratic Party's presidential election slotted for September. He insisted that the ruling party must demonstrate change. This change seems to be coming with a number of candidates that are preparing to step up to the role in the coming votes. For more on this, we have other than a world, special, world news special correspondent. This is Rashita Chandrasena from Tokyo in Japan. Hi Akil. With typhoon looming all over Japan, markets had a typhoon-like day today. The Nikkei 225 was up around 3% and is edging past or towards 38,000, the highs we had in April. So overall, this good market is due to the fact that the uh, sound economic stats came out last morning, uh, yesterday's morning, when the Japanese GDP, the real GDP was increased by 0.8% and for the first time their GDP in yen value is expected to be 600 trillion Japanese yen which is roughly about 4 trillion yen even though the dollar figures due to the weak yen has made the Japanese GDP lower compared to its peers but appears the yen value has made it one of the highest GDP ever recorded. And there's a bit of typhoons-like news in the election side as well. As we all know, the Prime Minister Kishida announced that he will not stand as a candidate for the next month at the ruling LDP's leadership election. And he will relinquish the Prime Ministership to the whoever wins in that elections. So we have few candidates, the names popping up already. The usual ones like Ishiba-san, Takayachi-san and Kono Taro-san, the current digital minister. But in a LDP election, just like any other election, every candidate needs to have at least 20 endorsements from the parliamentarians. And some might say Ishiba-san, despite his popularity with the general public, might struggle to get the 20 members now. So as of today, there is one uh, dark horse candidate, a young guy named Kobayashi. He was an ex-minister and is a potential a youth leader and he's, he's a potential leader in the LDP. He announced that he already have the 20 endorsement and he officially declared his candidacy. So people are, even though the dates are not officially declared, we expect the election to happen around uh, September 20th and the leadership uh, results would come in a day or two. That means most probably Japan would have a new prime minister by end of September. Over to you, Akil. Thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Rasita Chandrasey from Tokyo in Japan. That's it. And let's take a short commercial break for more world news on the other side.
Welcome back. And on the road to the White House, former President Trump held yet another hours-long press conference, his second this month in an effort to draw a stark contrast between his candidacy, policies and campaign versus his opponent's Vice President Kamala Harris, who has been dodging the media since becoming the Democratic presidential nominee. Trump held a press conference at his Bedminster, New Jersey property. The former president and Republican presidential nominee stood at the podium with groceries on display and delivered remarks focused on the rising costs under the Biden-Harris administration. He stated that Harris has just declared that tackling inflation will be a day one priority for her, but day one for Kamala was three and a half years ago. Harris has been the Democratic presumptive presidential nominee for 25 days and has not yet held a press conference or sit-down interview with the media. Trump said Harris's campaign is hiding her in a similar way he said the Biden campaign was hiding him. Sources in Trump's political orbit say that top advisers to the former president are quietly aiming to persuade him to tamp down the insults to Harris and the questioning of the vice president's racial identity and instead focus on branding her an ultra-liberal and spotlighting her stance on the border, crime and inflation. Negotiations have resumed in an effort to broker a ceasefire in Gaza despite Hamas being absent from the talks. This comes as a news report reveals that the death toll in a Palestinian enclave has surpassed 40,000 after more than 10 months of ongoing conflict. Amid growing concerns over the conflict in the Middle East escalating, mediators from the U.S., Qatar and Egypt met with an Israeli delegation in Doha on Thursday afternoon to open a new round of negotiations to broker a ceasefire in the war in Gaza. While Hamas officials are not participating in the talks, mediators will be consulting with the group's Doha-based negotiating team after the second day of discussions on Friday as they seek to reach an agreement. White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said that while there was a promising start to the new round of talks, there remains a lot of work to do, adding that the remaining obstacles can be overcome. The renewed push for talks comes at a vital time following the recent back-to-back -back assassinations at the end of July of Hezbollah's top commander and Hamas's political chief, which had led both the Lebanese group and Iran to blame Israel and threaten revenge that has fed fears of a wider regional escalation. While Hamas and Israel had, in principle, come to an agreement to implement a three-phase plan previously proposed by U.S. President Joe Biden, both sides have since requested amendments and clarifications. Large gaps remain between the two sides, including regarding control of land along the Gaza-Egypt border, the release of hostages, and the return of displaced Palestinian civilians to northern Gaza. Meanwhile, as talks were underway in Doha, ground operations continued in Gaza's southern city of Khan Yunis. The Gaza Health Ministry said Thursday that Israeli airstrikes had killed 40 people in the Strip in the previous 24 hours, pushing the Palestinian death toll to over 40,000 since the war broke out in October last year. Over 92,000 others have been injured. Ukraine continued its incursion into Russia's Kursk region for the 10th day, with both sides engaging in a fierce clashes. While Russia claims that they have recaptured some of the villages taken over by Ukraine, Kyiv says otherwise, saying they're continuing to advance into Russia. As Ukraine's offensive in Russia's Kursk region moved into its 10th day on Thursday, Russia says it has taken back some of the villages initially captured by the Ukrainian military. However, Kyiv says its military has been continuing to advance further into the region adding that a military command and control center was even set up in Kursk. Ukraine's top military commander also added that the troops had advanced up to 1.5 kilometers over the previous 24 hours and has seized 82 villages and 1,150 square kilometers of territory so far. Meanwhile, Russia has declared a state of emergency in the border region of Belgorod following attacks by Ukrainian forces. The decision comes as Ukraine has conducted daily attacks in Belgrade and nearby regions. Meanwhile, according to the Wall Street Journal on Thursday, Ukraine was behind the Nord Stream pipeline explosion in 2022. The report says that a small crew of six Ukrainian soldiers and divers were behind the sabotage. 
The report further alleges that the operation was planned out during a drunken night in May 2022 and was initially approved by Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. However, after the CIA found out about the plan, Kyiv was told to stop. Despite that call, then Ukraine's Armed Forces Commander-in-Chief went ahead with the operation. Ukraine has denied the report by the Wall Street Journal and instead continued to insist that Russia was behind the sabotage, adding that only Moscow can carry it out with such extensive technical and financial resources. U.S. President Joe Biden seemingly backed a new election in Venezuela. After Brazilian President Luiz Incaio, Lulu da Silva also floated the idea, despite rebuffs from the Venezuela's ruling party and its oppositions, which both claim victory. U.S. President Joe Biden said on Thursday that he supported a new election in Venezuela. The U.S. has rejected the claim by Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro that he won a third term after multiple exit polls pointed to an opposition victory. Many Venezuelans also reject Maduro's claim as protests have erupted across the country, with opposition leaders calling for supporters to keep up the demonstrations until they are recognized for what they claim was a resounding victory. On Thursday, Brazilian President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva suggested that Maduro could call a new contest involving international observers. Brazil's leader also said a coalition government could be another possible solution for Venezuela. But so far, Venezuela's ruling party and the opposition have ruled out Biden and Lula's suggestions. Machado has thrown her support behind presidential candidate Edmundo González. Tallies posted online by the opposition show González received 67 percent of the vote. But Venezuela's electoral authority proclaimed Maduro won 51 percent of the vote, but has not divulged full vote tallies. Five people have been charged with causing Friends star Matthew Perry overdose death. Authorities say that the defendants were part of a criminal network that distributed ketamine to Perry and others. Five people have been charged with causing friend star Matthew Perry's overdose death. Authorities say the defendants were part of a criminal network that distributed ketamine to Perry and others. Two have been arrested. Ketamine is a short-acting anesthetic with hallucinogenic properties, sometimes prescribed to treat depression. For months, Los Angeles homicide detectives and federal agents have been investigating how Perry obtained the prescription drug. Perry had publicly acknowledged decades of drug and alcohol abuse including during the years he starred as Chandler Bing on the hit 1990s television sitcom Friends. He was found floating face down in his hot tub at his Los Angeles home last October. He died of the acute effects of ketamine, according to an autopsy report. It's going for a short commercial break. More well news right after this. Welcome back. Brussels Historic Square was covered with a colourful carpet of almost a million flowers as part of the Flower Carpet, event which is on the 23rd edition. This 70 metre long and 24 metre wide flower carpet designed by street artist Oshin Cornel is called Rizomi. More than 100 volunteers spent around six hours creating this piece. The floral puzzle is for the first time made up for more than 80% fresh dalais rather than the traditional begonias as they are more resistant um, while still being grown in Belgium. The carpet will be on display until Sunday and the public are able to enjoy panoramic view of a carpet of flowers from the balcony of the town hall. The first flower carpet in Brussels was created by landscape architect Etini Sutumas in 1971. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin wrapping up this week. With that, we'll also come in again on Monday with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as we have Vinit Veersuryo who will join you next with Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Good night.